Maybe you just allow yourself to feel joy despite the world and all of its madness. To be joyful in that space is a powerful revolutionary act. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute, in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good. Asking them each our one question, in the midst of all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? And my guest today is the wonderful Sarah Kroll, who says she is an unapologetically Black queer dancer and choreographer who has taught dance, theater, mindfulness, arts integration, and violence prevention for over 30 years. She performed and toured with multiple dance companies for 15 years, including Impulse Jazz Dance Company in Boston and the Dance Brigade in San Francisco. She also co-directed the dance theater company I Am Productions. Sarah is the artistic director emeritus at Destiny Arts Center in Oakland, where she served in different capacities for over 30 years. She founded and co-directed the award-winning Destiny Arts Youth Performance Company, which was the subject of two documentary films. She is the recipient of many awards, including KQED Women's History Local Hero uh, Award and the Bay Area Dance Week Award. She is a four-time finalist for the Tony Award for Excellence in Theater Education. Sarah believes passionately that movement must be part of all movements for social change. Here's Sarah. Welcome, Sarah Kroll, to What Could Possibly Go Right. And you are a dancer, you are a teacher, you are a founder of the Destiny Arts Center, and in, you know, since 1988, inspiring and igniting social change through the arts. And your life is an expression of your belief that we can make a difference and that we can shape the destiny that we live, um, one that is authentic through telling our honest personal stories. And this is actually, this is so true for me too. Um, the more I tell the truth about my life, the more liberated I become. And uh, you work with youth of color to support them in transforming the pain of bullying, sexism, gentrification, and racism to create art out of their pain and to do it together. And so I see that people of my skin color and relative privilege, especially young people, are now feeling the pain of being othered, of hatred coming at us out of what others believe we represent, not who we are, and out of sliding down the progress mountain they thought it was their right to climb. And so we're experiencing uh, things that people of color have experienced for many years. And so I think it's especially important right now to hear from you in this time of unraveling expectations and the loss of anticipated futures. So I am so interested in how you are going to approach our question, Sarah Kroll, in the face of all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? Well, I'm so interested to see what I'm gonna to say too. I really <laughs> love this question. I think it's a really important question. Um, you know, I was in a, a meeting with a coworker the other day who said they had spoken to V, formerly Eve Ensler, and she said, one of the most radical acts we can do is to deeply listen to people. And so the fact, Vicki, that you're um, taking time to really listen to people answer this question is really powerful. Um, and I think like in your setup, you're talking about like, as things are, are shifting in terms of heteropatriarchy, in terms of white supremacy, as things are, the, the sort of veil is being pulled away and there are cracks in, in that system that need to be gently, hopefully, or it looks like it may be not so gentle, blown apart, right? Those things need to be obliterated and supremacy needs to be laid down so that we can all be in a circle, right? Um, and you're saying that white folks are, are feeling even just a small portion of what folks of color have been feeling for hundreds and hundreds of years on this planet. And, and I think it's important it's kind of like deep listening, deep listening and empathy. I, I'm, I come from, my work 
is is very empathic because I I just am an empathic person. And I think to understand, you don't want to, we don't want to feel each other's pain to the point of just shut down. But to understand someone's pain, to deeply listen to what has happened, I think is is really important. In fact, this morning, um, I'm a part of a group of women of color who are artists and activists from around the country. And we have a, a WhatsApp chain. So, so we get to like check in with each other and support one another. Um, and I think that's one thing that's going right, you know, as people are coming together in groups and, and expanding their circles. Um, and this morning, someone expressed just incredible grief uh, about the killings of Black men and how they're going, you know, without being accountable for, for them and have been done for generations. So George Floyd's murder was accounted for. And yet there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every year that, that um, where police officers or other citizens are being let off the hook. And the response from one of the members of our group was, I'm going to read it to you. She said, thank you for speaking your not okayness into this space. I'm sitting with the helplessness these murders invoke, not just for the victims and their families, but for Black people. The terror, it, it, the terror visits on us. I'm learning that in order to not walk through my life anxious and cynical and bitter and to keep my hope and love intact, I need to speak my feelings of fear and helplessness into circles like this. I need to be witnessed. And so the power of witness, I think, is really important. And that's like a lot of what the work that I did at Destiny Art Center for 30 years um, was about. Destiny Art Center, and thank you for introducing it so beautifully, is a, a nonprofit violence prevention and arts education organization. It's been around since 1988. Um, I just left the organization at the end of 2020, but I did a bunch of stuff there from executive director to dance teacher to artistic director um, to running our and co-directing and co-producing performances, but co-directing our Destiny Arts Youth Performance Company, which is a teen dance theater company. And we do, and you talked a little bit about that group, we do um, performances that are really intimate, authentic collaborations between professional artists and young people to talk about what their issues are, to deep listen, right? To have this witnessing and this listening and then to create work from that place. And to me, I think it's rare, you know, and sometimes people don't understand. I mean, we, we say like the process is just as important as the product, right? I think in this instance, as a person who's done youth development work and also performance work, so I, like, I, I'm always wanting to balance, like, are the young people really being heard? Are they telling their stories in authentic ways? And is the art really beautiful on stage? And, can, and then can that be accessible to audiences? Because if it's so beautiful, even painful things, if they're beautiful, you can't look away from them. And then you're changed by them, you know? So I think that's something that's going right. Uh, spaces where young people are being heard and they're given the opportunity to speak their voice, but also to collaborate with professionals who know what they're doing. So we're like, like I think the work at Destiny is really about creating opportunities for mentorship which oftentimes um, I think adults now, like we're, we're nervous, like, oh, the kids are so independent. We, we can't tell them anything. They know more about technology than we do. We need to be in intimate spaces with young people, creative spaces with young people in order to survive. You know, that's, that's my, my thing that uplifting young people, uplifting women of color, uplifting queer people, uplifting folks who have been outside the circle of human concern and having them be in the circle, not being in the center necessary, like obliterating the idea that someone has to be supreme, but how do we be in circle with each other? So to me, even though I, I dip into hopelessness about so many things that are happening in the world, what I look at is young people who are willing to take the risk to tell a story, to, to take the risk to speak truth to power and, and to do in a way that's not about blame, 
and shame and othering, but it's about bringing them into the circle with them. You know, and that's the work that I did at Destiny for 30 years. And and like my dad said, who was a, a lifelong activist, I would ask him like, how, how do you be so joyful? How are you so joyful, dad? You know, he died at 87, three years ago. And how are you joyful? Like he would just see like a butterfly or or the inside of a flower and, and begin to weep because he was so moved. And yet he was tackling the most difficult political and social issues through his activism. And he says, you know, I get up and I do my best. I do everything I can to make this world better for everyone. And then I go to sleep happy. You know, that's what I feel like I do. I learned that from him. And I do that each day. I like find something beautiful to love and to, to pay attention to. And, and then do the work that I do, which is I get paid to do change work. So how lucky am I? Right. <laughs> wow. I um very moving. And um, the question that comes to mind, because it's my question as well, is how do we bring our hearts into the affairs of the world such that we're not othered for having feelings, for believing that joy is relevant? I mean, here we are, and the news blares with war, injustice, pandemic, da da da, and and. And one of the things that can happen from that is that we do feel disempowered. And it's super easy to feel that, especially, you know, with the wealth gap, you know, it's like, okay, fine, there's 50 people running the world and then there's us. So it's like there is some gap between the power to make change, the, you know, the, the powerful and the rest of us who are humans with feelings. It's like, I just would love to know what you see about bridging that gap mm. uh, between the, the sense that you have to be like, you know, like super uber educated. You have to be Anthony Blinken or Jen Psaki, you know, <laughs> in order to, you know, have a voice, you know, that, so it's, it, I just reflect on that for me. Let's see where we can go. No, I love that question. I think it's, I think for anyone who loves this planet, that's a question, no matter, no matter what kind of work we do, it's constantly like we are the barrage of negative things, you know, and things that seem climate change and racial injustice and war and the threat of possibly a third world war. I mean, this is some serious stuff and pandemic. So it's like, are we gonna survive? Are we gonna survive is often the question. And I think young people who I've worked with for many years, right? They ask that question too. And it's, it's a different set, sort of sense of urgency that they have. And what I've told my students and I, for many years is that being joyful, even as the world does what it does and is doing what it does and seems more and more urgent and more and more important to understand and unpack, like you said, to be joyful in that space is a powerful revolutionary act. Now I'm not talking about denial. I'm not talking about, I'm just gonna ignore that and just be happy over here. No, I'm gonna know what's happening and choose joy every single day. How do I do that? I mean, to me, it's like the how is just whatever, whatever makes sense to you, right? And maybe each opportunity to feel joyful is also an act of service, right? And, and maybe an act of service is brings you joy. And so you do that. And maybe you just allow yourself to feel joy despite the world and all of its madness. And then for me anyway, if I allow that joy, if I allow that moment to notice the hummingbird in my window, if I allow myself to look in the mirror and notice my wrinkles starting to come through and revel in the fact that I'm alive, 
and and I get to have wrinkles because I'm aging. I get to age. Like, what an amazing experience to age. If I like find those moments, whatever they are for me each day, then I'm then I come back to what a friend of, of mine um, and I call the church of enthusiasm. Like, like how do we have enthusiasm for doing the next right thing, mm. you know? And I mean, and it's so many years of, for me, in order to be in this state, so many years of deep meditation and therapy and 12 step for codependency and like so many ways to heal in order to arrive in this present moment with my heart as full as possible, you know, and, and have compassion for people who, who may wish me ill. How do I have that? You know, uh, uh, one teacher of mine, Byron Katie, she says, I know when I walk in the room that everyone loves me, they just might not know it yet. <laughs> it's like, there's so many pearls of wisdom in this world. You know, there's so many people doing incredible work from the young people that I've worked with at Destiny Art Center to spiritual teachers that are, you know, spreading their wisdom. And, and for me, you know, I always like, when I'm listening to spiritual teachers, I'm like, does it resonate with me? Mm -hmm. Right? Because people you can get caught in the egoic space, and then follow blindly. So I always check in and I love that I'm very kinesthetic. I'm a dancer. Yes. And everything just sort of comes through my body. So I can check my body like, does that resonate for me? Yes, I like that. So the 12 step thing, take what you want and leave the rest. That works for me. It's like, what, what works for me? Channel it through myself at this moment and be in the, in the best space that I can be every day, mm -hmm. every moment. Wow. I, I, one of the things that came to me as you were talking, um, is I wonder how many people actually feel that they're masters of the universe. You know, there's, there's a lot of egoic people who think they're masters of the universe who aren't. But, you know, the people that we might project on, like, you know, these guys are running the show. How many of them feel, you know, this sort of self-doubt? And, mm. like, and so I, I just had this sense when you're talking the term public compassion. Mm. you know, compassion for the people who may not love us yet, you know, <laughs> compassion for the people who are on a daily basis having to frame things up. So do they have a feeling of control? I mean, this idea of public joy, if you will, is not in opposition to the dark forces. You know, it's just, it's an invitation. It's an invitation mm. to enter the circle to bring your own joy to the circle, you know, it's, it's, um, there's something about, about, I just think there's something in humans about status, about one up and one down. And once you get into that, then you've projected that on, I'm one down there, one up, and you're gone. There is no circle. So it's really right. radical what you're talking about. It's not hierarchy. It's not, you know, centering one subset over another subset. It's like the circle, the radical circle of the people who are trying to figure this place out and make the best of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like like a, a friend of mine who's also a mentor, Akai Windwood. She mm. she said I I used to do affinity groups when I was doing anti racism work. She's like, and now I just sit everybody in the circle and we're going to work it out together because that's mm -hmm. ultimately what we need to do. Now that doesn't mean that we don't sit in circles of, of folks of color or that white people don't need to do their own work without folks of color educating constantly around racism. And ultimately, we need to sit in a circle. It's like Thich Nhat Hanh, another spiritual teacher of mine. He says, you can get a lot from sitting by yourself in meditation, but you will only achieve enlightenment if you do spiritual work in community. You know, and so for me, that's that's like every single day. So at Destiny, everything was in a circle. You start 
in a circle, there's a guided meditation, there's a check-in, there's some kind of recognition that we're all in this together. It doesn't mean there isn't hierarchy. So there's like, there's that subtle difference between supremacy and hierarchy. I think leadership always is gonna have some hierarchy. There's gonna be some people that are better at things than other things that, that will pull up and be leaders. I love to do this metaphor, um, doing salsa partnering dance and talking about leading and following. And how do we rethink that whole hierarchy, that whole us and them that you're talking about? How do we rethink that into a flow and an exchange? So when you're in, in a partnership, in a dance partnership, doing salsa partnering work, the leader has got to be strong and, and clear with their directions. They also can't push too hard. If you push too hard, the follower doesn't look as beautiful, right? And there's part of that is the leader is there to uplift and make beautiful the follower. The follower can't also like get, oh, you're not doing it right and, and super overcritical. There has to be some flow between the partners that's, that's a giving and receiving. So when I look at it that way, there's no better than or less than in leading and following. Right, it's sort of like that that phrase. It's better to give than to receive. I hate that phrase. It's like, <laughs> what the hell is that about? It's like, you know, well, what about then the receiver is is just dirt? You know what I mean? Like, the receiver to give is righteous. To receive with a, an open heart is also righteous. Like uh, another, I have so many teachers. Guru Mai is one of my spiritual teachers, um, uh, Indian guru. And she says, when you give, you have more room to receive. And then when you receive, you have more to give. And then it becomes this expansive process and it creates this sense of enthusiasm and invigoration, right? That, that we're willing to receive. So I would talk with my students as much about being generous um, with giving as being generous with receiving. Mm -hmm. So when we would do like a circle in the beginning, so I was talking about the circle, there's a circle, an opening circle, there's a meditation, there's a, there's a recognition that everyone in, in the circle belongs, so different exercise to do that. And then at the end, there's a gratitude circle. And in the gratitude circle, I always encourage people when they're receiving gratitude to open up their bodies. To, to really receive it. I mean, I remember when I first started doing these gratitude circles with, the, with my students years ago at Destiny, I would get this showering of love, you know, after some big event or whatever, that's all this gratitude. And I would go home and I would weep, like I couldn't handle it. I couldn't hold it all. I couldn't receive it all. And then I didn't have as, then I would feel depleted, right? Because they were giving all this, they wanted me to receive it. And so I look over the years, I slowly developed the capacity to receive the amount of love that, that I was getting in order to just feel good, A, and also to be able to have more to give. And so when I left Destiny after 30 years, people were like, oh, you must be burnt out, nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, I'm not burnt out. And I wanna be very clear, I wanna make it plain. It doesn't mean that I didn't have days where I was tired, but, I wanna be clear, this is not about burnout. You don't have to burn out when you're in being of service, but you need to know how to replenish yourself. And it's not just about going away and doing self-care, which I think is extremely important um, for any leader or any member of, of a community that's doing change work. But I think it's also in the moments of the work it feel ex feeling that exchange right and i could tell that i was becoming i had more and more capacity over the years as i focused on it to be less depleted like when i walked into the to the to workplace i was like ah you know like this day i will bring love through my thoughts my words and my actions and i'll receive it in return it's, it's like a state, right? It doesn't mean, you know, and if it may sound for people a little corny and a little like woo woo, 
For me, it's not. It's very practical. I'm a Taurus. It's very practical. And, and it's practical in that it requires steady, like concentration and also creating um, ways of being in relationship with each other that give that opportunity for exchange, right? So it could be, I answer the phone, Destiny Art Center, this is Sarah. And somebody says, I'm looking for somebody who can give me so-and-so. Ah, we don't have that, but I have a list of people that I can send you to. And then we have this delighted exchange. And if I don't receive that, like, oh my God, thank you so much. And just like go on to my next task, then I might feel tired at the end of the day, but I'll just take it in. It doesn't take extra time. It's just, I take it in like, oh, this person was grateful for what I gave to them. And I was grateful for they, that they called me to ask. So it's just like a, I don't know, for me, it's been a, a shift of the way that I look at things. It doesn't mean that I don't feel despair about racial violence or inequities or all of the isms that feel like they're raining down on us right now. And yet I say over and over joy, to feel joy, to express joy, to emanate joy is a revolutionary act. Mm. Wow. It so resonates with me. I mean, everything you're saying, I can feel, I can feel like there's um, a, 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 an opening between right and wrong. And that you're talking mm. about and, th and through that opening and that it's so easy to tip into despair or hope, you know, both of those being sort of a withdrawal from the present moment, which is beautiful stuff is a beautiful stuff is being exchanged. And if somebody's mad at you, you can, you can take that as like, wow, they're really willing to show up in this conversation. They're not like being polite and just like, you know, mm. <laughs> like, thank you very much. You know? <laughs> they're not Exactly. No, it's, it's brilliant like, when people come to you to, and say, look, this didn't work for me. Like it's courageous, right? To have those conversations. Totally. And I, and so if we're, if we're the recipient of that, we need to be able to receive it, not in a, like as a bludgeon, but as a gift, right? And, and that's, and like I said, this is not easy stuff, but there was one, I have a story that, that remind, you reminded me of. So at Destiny Art Center, there was a group of folks who were doing some work there. They had, I, I won't tell the full story, but there was some bad feeling about the administration at Destiny. And there was a lot of feeling that that Destiny was upholding anti-Blackness. And as a, as a Black woman, as a, uh, an organization that's run by mostly people of color, who serves mostly people of color, primarily Black folks, I was like, well, no. And I, got, I felt defensiveness. And, you know, long story short, um, I was like, let me find that in me. Mm -hmm as a leader at an organization who represents an organization, let me find anti-Blackness in me. Because anti-Blackness, internalized oppression is real, right? Anti-Blackness is real. Um, so I found it and then I got counsel, I, I talked to people, I prayed, I meditated, I, I like drank water, I like, in, before I met with this group of folks who wanted to talk to me. And my prayer was, let me be a good listener, like a really deep listener. I want them to walk away feeling heard. And I want my heart to be open. Mm. Those were my main prayers. So I sat with them and we talked about, I mean, they talked, I just said to them, look, I really want to listen. I'm happy to do problem solving and, and think about how we could make some shifts at the organization, you know, um, but mostly I want to listen. And I, you know, sort of back to what I said in the beginning, which is deep listening is a revolutionary act as well. Um, and so I listened and I could feel myself really present. Thank God for all the people who helped me get there. Thank God for my, the meditation practice, all of the things. And by the end of our conversation, we sat for about an hour and they had many critical things to say. Um, my chest felt like, a pool of water 
it was so soft. And I felt this sense of bliss that I had connected with these people, that I had provided an opportunity for them to speak truth to power because for them, I was the person in power and that was true. And I just, I don't know, it was a, a deeply powerful experience for me. And it made, it sort of made me feel like, oh, the guardedness that I often feel and I imagine many of us feel when people have criticism of us, mm -hmm. um, it's useful to a point, right? I mean, we don't want somebody coming at us with a bludgeon. And if we can create opportunities for deep listening, you know, truth and reconciliation, if you will, I mean, it is powerful beyond measure. Like, I, I don't think, I know that I had not experienced the power of that before, and this was only a few years ago. And I imagine most of us don't give ourselves the opportunity to feel the power from that type of exchange. I know that I've been very defensive, like, no, you can't tell me I'm wrong because then I'll feel bad about myself and then I'll, then I'll, it'll contract me. I don't want to feel that feeling. And yet we're here in a binary world mm. in order to experience all of the things, right? And so if I don't give myself the gift of experiencing my mistakes and, and the impact of my mistakes, then I don't get the fullness of this life, you know? Wow. Wow. I am... I, it's like I, I'm relating this to so many things in my own life. Um, this really is radical, what you're talking about, of living in a binary world. And we're, we're surrounded by binaries. If you want to talk about political polarization, that's a binary. You know, it's like it's it's uh, war. You know, like there's people who say, like, oh, Putin's right. No, no, you know, Ukraine is right everything is soaked in this binariness. And it's almost like that is a reflection of the intensity of what we're going through. This, you know, what you called in the beginning, I forget what you called it, but sort of like this, it has to break down. The veils are, the veils are, are breaking down. And so the app that, that, you know, it feels like this passage we're going through is how can we be in the binary in a way that transforms rather than intensifies the pain, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I feel like you're giving us such a gift around this, this thing about receiving that do gooders like, you know, like <laughs> me and many of my friends, you know, us do gooders, you know, um, who really want the world to be a better place, but can get so frustrated with people who are not, you know, behaving in a way that's <laughs> going to make us feel like it is getting better, you know? And so, it's, it's that challenge to find another place. And I think this is emblematic of the times we're in. It's a challenge to find another place to come from mm -hmm. in the work that's ahead of us, whether we like it or not. You know, so that's, I think what you're, it's, it's like, I can feel all, you know, and I, the other thing I want to say is that it takes a big person to share their truth while acknowledging all the teachers that have supported them in being able to see what they see. Mm. You know, it's like you're talking from all the all that you have received. You're not trying to say that I, you know, you were born wise out of a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> out of like an, some eggshell. No, it's like it's like acknowledging your teachers, acknowledging what we have received from our teachers is a piece of this work of finding that space of, of no resistance psychologically as, as things intensify. I'm just so appreciative of um, all that you've said. I'm taking it in. Do you have something that, that you want to wind up with? Absolutely. I mean, I, I really appreciate you um, saying the piece about me acknowledging my teachers and there's so many more that I, I haven't named. And 
so my students have been my teachers and my coworkers have been my teachers and people who have said mean things to me about whatever have been my teachers, you know, and it doesn't mean that I hang out with them, but I have gratitude for them. And there's this little girl, one last story, and then I'm going to read this quick little poem for you that one of my students wrote, because I really want to underline that that so many of the young people in my life have been teachers and I have been theirs and I accept, I accept that giving and receiving. Um, there's a little girl who came to me and she was like, I can't do dance anymore. She was probably six because I, I cut my finger. And so I was like, oh, you know, like her finger was like affecting her, her ability to dance. And I said, do you believe in magic? And she said, yeah. I said, well, I'm magic. And if I kiss your finger, it's going to be better. And she said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think some like honest skepticism is definitely discernment is important. We need to teach that to our kids. I said, are you ready? She said, yeah. So I kissed her finger very lightly. And I said, how does it feel? She's like, it feels better. I said, do you want to go back to dance? She's like, yes. And she just went. It's like, well, there's so many gifts all over the place that if we receive them, if we receive them, if we slow down just a, even just a little bit to receive the gifts that are abundant everywhere, then we can step into the world of binaries without so much of a shield or without so much of a, with, you know, our, without our fists up. Either one. I think that's, you know, I don't know if that's my teacherly moment, but I accept that I'm a teacher, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But there's this piece that, that one of my students who was at the time, she was 15 or 16, her name's Jelena Keen Lee. And um, she wrote this poem called, I Wish I Was a Painter. And I'm gonna, it's very short, I'm just gonna read it to you. She says, I wish I was a painter. If I were a painter, I would paint a new world. Not a world without conflict, but a world without ignorance. Not a world without anger, but a world without apathy. Each brush stroke, carefully creating communities and countries. Imagination, innovation, inspiration intertwined with the breeze. If I was a painter, I would recreate our cultural regression and relaunch a revolution. We can reinvigorate our nation. We can be the change we want to see. Together, we can paint the world with our words. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Kroll. Thank you so much, Vicki. What a pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.